Hello, today is Thursday, February 27th, 2020. I'm Joe Schmidt from TC2, and this is Staying Connected. On today's podcast, we're going to discuss something we've been hearing for years, and you may have as well, and that is the idea that in the enterprise, voice is dead, or at least dying. I'm pleased to be joined today by my two colleagues, Laura McDonald, a partner at LB3, and Keith Cook, a fellow TC2 director. So, Laura, what do you think? Is voice dead? Good day, Joe and Keith, and great question. And the answer is, for at least the last 15 years, the industry and the press have declared voice dead, or at least the traditional PSTN network. And we throw around a lot of acronyms. So PSTN, as a refresher, is the public switched telephone network. And that's traditionally the landline, the wired phone on your desk or at home on your wall, if you still have one. For enterprise users, it's embodied in services like PRI, ISDNs, T1s, and switched long distance. The claim that voice is dead is overstated. Traditional voice does live on, but one could reasonably say it's on life support. Think for a minute. How many millennials do you know that actually have a wired phone? And how many enterprises aren't using some type of voice over IP or SIP trunking for a majority or at least part of their voice? If you dig into the data on whether or not voice is actually dead and how much is left, one thing that can guide you is a recent FCC study that came out just last year, and it looked at switched access lines. And they said that switched access lines had declined at a compound annual growth rate of 12% per year. So that's pretty significant, but it's not death. You have to step back a second. The numbers that the FCC were looking at were over the three years prior to 2017. So my guess is the next time they do this research, they're going to find that that compound growth rate has increased quite a bit. But interestingly enough, they still found there was a significant amount of switched access retail. So it is not dead. One thing it's important when you're looking at this and the claims that are in the media of the industry is to understand where's the decline coming from. And some of that's really simple. It's the availability of better and often cheaper alternatives. Most enterprises, as we said, have moved to a SIP trunking or voice over IP model, and they're dismantling their local services. And they've long used MPLS, and now they're looking to SD-WAN for traffic routing. The decline of voice has also been fueled by the carrier's desire to get out of stricter regulations that are usually overlaying the traditional voice network and the cost of maintaining the traditional voice network, particularly when they've done a tremendous amount of investment in the digital coaxial and Ethernet networks. Yeah, and we know that wireless, it's pretty much fundamentally changed how people and, well, heck, machines communicate. So, Keith, do you still see enterprises using voice and PSTN? Indeed, I do, Joe. Voice, and by this I mean TDM-based analog voice-grade circuits, are still used. But as Laura noted, quantities continue the decline that started over a decade ago. Some examples are backup for small connections and applications for small offices and sites that don't really want even a small size WAN circuit. Many businesses, particularly retail or those who regularly receive visitors, have elevators that usually require some sort of standalone line. Alarm systems also still often use POTS lines, although wireless is becoming more common. Recall that POTS lines don't require external power. And that's often a requirement for such connections as these. Finally, there's one industry in particular, the medical field, that still use fax machines in a big way. And I'm not talking about large contact centers for pharmacies or benefit management companies, but I'm talking about the small doctor's offices, pharmacies, independent pharmacies. Fax lines are still ubiquitous there, turning out hundreds of thousands of pages per day across the country. So, Laura, what do the service providers think about voice? You know, honestly, I think the cares are somewhat conflicted. On one hand, yes, legacy TDM networks are expensive to maintain, and there are these extra regulatory overlays that are associated with them. On the other hand, they're already in place, and most of that infrastructure is depreciated, and the overlays, the regulatory overlays have softened over the last decade. Also, despite the newer technologies, carriers know that some businesses, as Keith just went through, still need these services. So there's a reluctance to eliminate them entirely. And when they've said they might, there's been a large hue and cry among certain segments of the market. Finally, I think there may be a little bit of a nostalgia factor. 
there's still a lot of executive leadership within the carriers that grew up with the PSTN, and they might not be quite ready to leave, particularly if their customers are still there. However, the TDM can also be a proverbial cash cow, and as long as that cash cow is there, they want to provide it. When the cash cow aspect begins to dry up, I suspect the nostalgia factor will go out the window. Indeed, and I'd like to elaborate on one angle or two of the voice cash cow. Several years ago, one of the major carriers dramatically increased its list rates for international calling. And I mean, they really jacked them up. Some of the undiscounted service guide rates are over $100 per minute. Some are nearly $200 per minute. This means that customers who don't have custom negotiated rates get hit with exorbitant cost typically for small volumes of calls to or from countries that aren't contained with custom rates in their deal. Now, sure, they're probably getting a maybe a 45 or even 50% discount, but that still means their net billed rates for these countries are well over $50 per minute. If your typical monthly invoice is legitimately several hundred thousands of dollars, this can go unnoticed. Just in the past year, I've seen three clients where this was happening to the tune of thirty to $40,000 per month extra. And note, I am not saying it's contractually incorrect or wrong because it's not, but it is quite egregious. And it's rather complicated to uncover it and then provide the documentation you need to your carrier and work with them to get the rates improved. And this is not the only area to look out for. Carriers have also increased their standard PRI rates recently, and there's substantial rate hikes there. So if you don't have negotiated, custom fixed pricing for those services, you may be taking a big hit, and you might not even know it. Wow, you know, that that's just really incredible. Now, hopefully, if anyone suspects they may have that sort of issue, they'll reach out to you, Keith. Now, Laura, what do businesses need in order to deal with decline of voice but inherently need for voice PSTN? Well, there's actually a lot the customer can do to minimize the pain of this kind of slow death of voice. I don't know that you can completely eliminate it, but there are controls that are within your reach. First of all, and this is always true, you have to know what you're using. And you have to know what you need to use over the next three to five years. So you have to have a plan in place based on actual knowledge. Customers should watch their invoices. As Keith just pointed out, there are red flags in your invoices that you need to be aware of. It's really easy to overlook your voice traffic invoices because they're a small part of your overall spend. But I'm always amazed at how many customers think they've disconnected services only to find out they've been billed for years for those same services. So have a method of how you do disconnects and follow up to make sure those disconnects are actually being done. You also need to check your contracts. As Keith pointed out, you may be getting rates that the carriers are lawfully allowed to charge you. So you need to close those loopholes. You need to look to see if you have a revenue commitment that's tied to voice. Some of the carriers do have your voice commitments tied to a revenue. So if you're going to migrate off of it, you need to make sure that you're not going to fall short of those revenues. Again, it goes back to knowing what you have, where you're going, and setting up a plan. You also need to make sure that you don't have circuit terms. Almost all the carriers have circuit terms associated with PRI, ISDNs, or the old T1s. Sometimes they'll be short. They'll be 12 months, and you can work around that, again, if you plan. But a lot of them are tied to the term of your contract, so you have no elasticity to actually move those off. You're hit either by a revenue shortfall or you're hit by a circuit term early termination. So you need to look at that and be planning ahead as you negotiate with the carriers. And you need to see what these solutions are in advance. The last thing you want to do is to let your contract expire without having these in place because then you're going to be hit with these exorbitant list rates that Keith was just talking about. While traditional voice may be the tail of the dog, the dog still has some bite, so proper diligence is essential. Okay, thank you, Laura, and thank you as well, Keith. This has truly been a great discussion. Now, if you think it's time to evaluate your use of legacy voice services or you'd like to learn more about LB3 and TC2 services, you can contact Laura, Keith, me, or any of our LB3 and TC2 colleagues by giving us a call or dropping us an email. And you can also stay current by checking out our new websites, subscribing to the Staying Connected podcast, or you can follow us on LinkedIn. 